on today's episode of the Cryptoverse. There's only one story worth talking about today. One story that dwarfs all the others. The Indahash ICO. Just kidding. It's the Segwit 2x hard fork that has been cancelled, which, yes, does mean you won't get any free money, but this has much wider implications. So we'll talk about all of that and a market roundup on today's episode of the Cryptoverse, so stay right there. Hi there guys, welcome to the latest episode of the Cryptoverse. Your regular dose of news and commentary on Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies and blockchains. I'm your host, Chris Coley. So as you can see, I'm still here at my hotel room in Warsaw in Poland. Because yesterday we did the Hindahash, Hindahash, Hindahash ICO live stream. So we'll talk about that later on. But for now, let's talk about Segwit2x. So the Segwit2x daily segment that I was doing to, to stay close to the numbers and monitor the progress towards the hard fork, that's no longer needed. In an open letter, Mike Belsch, I think his name is, the CEO of Bitco, Bitgo, who was one of the main leaders of the Segwit2x project, has announced that, boom, here it is, as fees, this is a quote from the letter, as fees rise on the blockchain, I assume he means the Bitcoin blockchain, we believe it will eventually become obvious that on-chain capacity increases are necessary. When that happens, we hope the community will come together and find a solution, possibly with a block size increase. Until then, we are suspending our plans for the upcoming two megabyte upgrade. So that's straight from the horse's mouth. Furthermore, the letter is signed by a number of other corporate leaders like Shapeshift, like block blockchain.info and so on. Now, specifically, there was a couple of words that I picked out here. The letter specifically says suspending our plans, meaning at some point, at some unknown date in the future, they may choose to bring this back to the table in an attempt to get a greater level of consensus around the idea of increasing the Bitcoin block size uh, and get a greater level of consensus in a such a way that it would avoid a split. So that was the big thing for them. They were like, it's... The, the community is too split over whether Segwit2x should happen or not. Right? There wasn't a great enough consensus to give them confidence it wouldn't cause havoc. So for now, Bitcoin remains as it is now with a one megabyte block size. And according to Segwit Party, which I'll show you the graph. According to Segwit Party here, still only around 10% of transactions are making use of SegWit, which means Bitcoin is almost exactly the same in terms of its capacity that it's had for years. So in terms of real world processing capacity, the Bitcoin network isn't performing any better than it was since the block size was increased to one megabytes about two years ago. And of course, the net result of that is if we look at the network stats from BTC Dot com, we see right now we have 63 megabytes worth of transactions in the unconfirmed transactions pool. Now, at the rate of six megabytes per hour, that's going to take more than 10 hours to clear. So that leaves us with two Bitcoins to choose from. One is regular Bitcoin with SegWit and one megabyte blocks or Bitcoin Cash which currently has no SegWit and eight megabyte blocks. And as you remember, the Bitcoin Cash hard fork is still aiming to go ahead. And this hard fork is gonna fix the mining problems on Bitcoin Cash, where the mining difficulty swings so wildly and gives unpredictable block times. Now, assuming that goes smoothly, it will position Bitcoin Cash as a credible competitor to Bitcoin in terms of the service it provides, right, as a payment network because you'll be able to almost guarantee to get your uh, transaction confirmed in the next block. And assuming they sort out their mining problems, it should get the block times back down to 10 minutes consistently. 
Now, the death of Segwit2x, therefore, isn't much of a loss at all, because on the one hand, you've got a choice between sending Bitcoin on-chain, and if you want to do that, you can use Bitcoin Cash with its 8 megabyte blocks. If you don't want to do that, you can just use the regular Bitcoin, which is currently the most dominant. And then coincidentally, in the land of Dash, if we hop over here to uh, Mark Mason's Twitter account, Dash, coincidentally, on the day that the two megabyte Bitcoin hard fork was called off, Dash released version 12.2 of the software, increasing the Dash block size from one megabyte to two megabytes. So that's kind of interesting. And so in this tweet, Mark is boasting that, you know, Bitcoin, sorry, Dash now has eight times more capacity than Bitcoin. And that's, you get to that by multiplying the block time by four, because Dash has a two and a half minute block time and Bitcoin has a 10 minute block time. So Bitcoin, one megabyte block every 10 minutes, Dash used to be one megabyte block every two and a half minutes. So that would be four times. And now they've doubled the block size. So now every two and a half minutes, you've got a two megabyte block. So while every 10 minutes, Bitcoin is pr processing one meg of transactions, every 10 minutes, Dash is now gonna be processing eight megabytes worth of transactions. And that means currently the Dash transaction fees are a lot lower. However, someone did point out in response to that tweet, it's not really fair to say that Dash has ridiculously low fees when there is much less demand for transactions on the Dash network compared to the Bitcoin network. The question is, how would Dash handle it if you took all of the transactions off the Bitcoin network and dumped them on Dash, right? It would be interesting to see what would happen. The only real way to know is to do it for real. So Dash is gonna have to scale up and see if their technology is solid in the real world. So let's do one final round of checks on the Segwit2x numbers, just to put some data behind the cancellation of the fork. So we've been looking at the Segwit2x countdown and if we look at it now, it's got a big Segwit2x suspended on it. So that kind of sorts that out. In terms of Bitcoin futures, if we just refresh this on CoinMarketCap, it says we are looking at the, the previous price was down 77%. But if I just refresh this, I want to see what the latest figure is. While it's, there it is, $293. Very interesting. The fact that that hasn't gone to zero means people are still trading it, which is kind of interesting, isn't it? I don't know who wants to buy a Segwit 2X future now. Maybe they haven't heard the news. And then final figure, let's see if we look at Coindance. We're still seeing 80.6% support from miners with their intention to support Segwit 2X. So you would assume that would drop off, but um, to, to, for Segwit 2X to be to be viable, the miners couldn't just go and fork off on their own because they'd need the infrastructure support and all that kind of stuff. But now things like blockchain.info and Bitmain and Shapeshift have all withdrawn support. If the miners continued to charge ahead and fork Segwit to X, then they'd be doing it on their own, wouldn't they? So there are some. St the reason I showed you that is because there are still some numbers like 80% miner support that go against the idea that it's been canceled. Do you know what I mean? So hypothetically speaking, those 80% of miners could carry on and fork Segwit 2X. So that's why I want to give that objective view of the whole situation rather than just spreading the same old news that this letter has come out and, you know, as far as we know, it's been canceled. But that letter just says that those people have withdrawn support and those companies, which is a significant blow to Segwit 2X. However, looking at the miner support, technically, if you look at it purely technically, technically and hypothetically, the miners could continue to do it. So I'm still gonna keep an eye on that mining figure because I wanna see that drop off completely to give me absolute confidence that Segwit2x is dead. Also worth mentioning that the recording of yesterday's live stream is now live on the channel. I'll give you a shot of it right here. So if you go straight to the Cryptoverse YouTube channel, look at videos. This is the recording of yesterday's live stream. So if you're the type that likes long form content, there's a three hour video of me talking about the in ICO and covering it as it goes live. The 
the broadcast started an hour before the ICO launched, and then we went for uh, two hours after that. So that was broadcast right from the headquarters uh, down the street in Warsaw in Poland. So there we go. So let's finish up with a market roundup. We'll do winners and losers. Then we'll do chart readings for Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin Dash, Ethereum, and Monero because those are the most interesting charts to me today. So we're going to use OCFX for the data. Let me share the old screen again so we can look at these numbers. I'm just getting a refresh right now to get the most up-to-date figures. Unfortunately, because I'm recording this at the same time, it seems to have slowed my computer down, but there we go. All right, so biggest gainers of the day. We have Vertcoin with a massive 40% gain on the day to $5.02. Some of my patrons were talking about Vertcoin in the chat group, um, and it seems to be a nice balance between all the best bits of cryptocurrency, including the ability to do some atomic swaps. That's uh, a great sign. There's SALT up at 39%, 39.36% to $4.17. You've got more double digit gains here for IOTA, 35% gain on the day. Gas from Neo Gas up 34% almost, and ARC up 31%. So Euphoria has hit the cryptocurrency markets once again. Now, oddly enough, in the last 24 hours, Bitcoin is the biggest loser down 2.5% to, unfortunately, $7,219. First coin down 2%, Bitcoin Cash down 1.9%. We've got uh, Tron down just 0.16% and Bitcoin Cash down 0.14%. So even the losers haven't lost that much. The net result for today is a huge gain across the board. Total market cap according to OCFX right now is sitting at 197 billion and Bitcoin's dominance at 61%. So chart readings, let's hop over to Coinigy to do five chart readings before we close this out. Let's begin with Bitcoin Cash. Yesterday, Bitcoin Cash had a bit of a, it looked like it was gonna have a bad day because it broke down below one of its support lines at $580. The low of the day was 521 and it recovered by the end of the day right above six, uh, 600 it was. Closed the day out at 618 and right now it's trading around 630. So it's right back inside of its training range that I was predicting. The bottom of that training range is 580. The top of that training range is 672. So I reckon it's gonna bounce in between that for the time being, barring any major positive or negative news. Bitcoin itself had a bit of a crazy going on. It was about half past five UTC yesterday when the news came out, three hours later, all hell broke loose and Bitcoin went absolutely mental, up and down. It did set a new all-time high right here at 7,899, so near enough $7,900, but it came right back down under that once again and is pretty much on par where it's been for the last four or five days, around 7,200. And we're forming a bit of a red bar today. It looks like a reversal of yesterday's price movement and consolidating above 7,000 by the looks of this. I may have to redraw my Fibonacci retracement lines now because we've set another all-time high, but I'll do that off stream. And, you know, we were talking about Dash. We said we, we saw the early signs of it turning around, and then that further continued, and now Dash has broken out to the upside, and it has got some serious momentum to the upside. So when it broke out of its downtrending channel, it was about $271, and then it broke right above one of its resistance lines. It was the 60... Sorry, the 38% Fib line, it broke $300 and is now trading around $321. It set a bit of a high test and rejection bar here. It got to the high of the day of $338, was rejected by the market and is now trading around $320 once again. Next, we have Ethereum. So still looking for some news out on the old Ethereum parity multisig wallet problem. Still doesn't seem to be affecting the Ethereum price though. It's still trading in its range between $300 and $319. Yesterday, we hit a high of $318.90. So 10 cents short of where I think the resistance line is. And like, like we said, it's been the price has been pretty steady around the $300 mark for a couple of weeks now. And that seems to be continuing. A flat 50 day moving average you'll notice there as well. The reason I want to talk about Monero as the final chart today is because it took off again. 
It was back, when did they have a massive run up? This was uh, August time when Monero suddenly went a way above $50 for the first time within, within a matter of days. It went from $45 up to $155 like within a week. And that was insane. Then it settled down to around about 100 and now it was sat there for well a month or two and then a couple of days ago it went on for a big run is now broken 100 dollars. and yesterday with all the euphoria around bitcoin i assume it's now rallied up to the 113 dollar mark which is its 38 percent fib level so that is a key resistance point for monero to break if it can break it it might be heading towards three sorry 130 dollars would be the next target if monero can break above 113 and hold so that's all for today so thanks very much for joining me today guys if you like this episode go ahead and hit that like button and if you're new around here hit subscribe and if you would like access to my very best materials such as my structured online courses that will teach you things like how to make and save money with bitcoin check out cryptobsd.com all right guys that is all for today i'll be back tomorrow with another episode of the crypto vest until then this is me Chris Coney.